Okay, um, let's start off. Let's kick off. There's quite a lot to cover. Um, the topic today is stress and we are doing it in two sessions, aren't we? The one hour this week and one hour next week. And it's a huge topic. It's a tall order. I've tried to summarize it into a few points for today's session. So let's crack on. And this is a brief introduction. Um, Satish has already introduced me, but let me introduce myself briefly. I'm trying to show off here. That's a self-portrait which I have done. It's an etching. I was born and bred in Mumbai, uh, so speak Marathi, Hindi, English, Malayalam, a little bit of Gujarati. Um, I have been in England for 25 years now. Um, I live in Sheffield. Um, I've been a consultant in child and adolescent psychiatry. Satish called me a psychologist. I think many people get confused between psychology and psychiatry. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, and being a creature of light as opposed to darkness, all my hobbies are light related, knitting, stitching, painting, drawing, embroidery, gardening, etc. Um, so that's who I am in, in a nutshell. Um, the hopes for today's session is for planting a few seeds into your minds and in the hope that it will grow. Yeah, so it's going to be a little um, menu of strategies and ideas, a little um, um, menu to choose from. So you can pick and choose what connects with you. So that's my hope. And the other hope is from you guys. If you ask me a question which I don't have an answer to, and if you challenge me to think and go back and look into my books, I'll be pleased. So just um, ask me. There's no stupid question. Feel free to ask questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll feel, oh, what a good audience. They've challenged me. They've pushed me. Um, the ground rules, um, I shall assume you guys have understood. Um, if you don't understand, please do ask. I do not have horns, I do not bite. And instead of a didactic, like an instructional session, if you want an open session, a QA and a session, a question and answer session, I'll stop it now. I'll stop my PowerPoint now and we can have an open session. If at any point you think the ideas are going over your head and it's too much to take in, ask for a QA and a session and I'll, I'll, I'll change to a QA. and a And at the end, we will have time for questions and answers. And what I want to say is that the principles which I put across are general principles. They are not uh, specific in the sense there will always, always be exceptions to the rules, you know. See, we are talking of psychiatry and psychology. We are not talking of mathematics. Two plus two does not always add up to four. So we are talking of life here. Life doesn't always neatly, we can't put life into compartments very neatly. We are so there will always be shades of gray. There will always be exceptions. There's no one glove fits all. There's no universal formula. So you need to understand that these principles are generic principles, okay? And um, let us start off with a poll. I'm not asking you to um, answer any poll, but the first question is, does everybody get stressed? And is there anybody in the audience who has no for this answer? Does everybody get stressed? Anybody who thinks the answer is no, anybody who thinks the answer is no, or is it, is it a unanimous yes? So I don't know whether you see the chat. So there is overwhelming response of yes in the chat. Yes, so, so that is the correct answer um, because um, sometime in your life, sometime in your life, you'll get stressed. I'm not saying everybody is stressed all the time. I'm not saying that, but sometime in your life from birth till death, sometime in your life, you'll get stressed. Even if you're a sadhu or a yogi, or you've overcome all, what to say, all the problems in life. And even if you're a highly evolved creature, sometime in your life, you'll get stressed and you expect life to go like that in a straight line, but it never goes like that in a straight line. This is how usually life goes in a tortuous way. That's a little bit exaggerated, but what I'm trying to say is if you look at the trajectory of life, if you look at the journey of your life, life never goes in a smooth line. It goes like this. Yeah, and this quote here, this quote which I've put here, if you look at my cursor moving, the only person without stress is a dead person. That quote is by Hans Selye, um, a Canadian endocrinologist, a doctor who did the most amount of research on stress. He's the guy who's done a lot of amount, lot of research on stress. And that's his quote, that the only person without stress is a dead person. So what we have concluded in this slide is everybody gets stressed sometime or the other in their life. Okay. And what is stress? Does anybody want to put in the chat box what stress is, what they understand of stress quickly? Because... Um, We've got quite a bit to cover in, in one hour. 
what is your understanding of stress? You can put it in the chat box. And Satish will shout out the answers to me. Something that disturbs tension. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Tension again. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Uh, so, what is stress? There is no unanimous or no uh, common consensus on the definition of stress. There is no universal consensus on the definition of uh, stress, and there is no um, what to say uniform definition of stress. The carry home message from this slide is when demands exceed our resources, when the external demands placed on us exceeds our resources, we are stressed. Does that make sense? When the pressures on us are more than what we can manage, there is stress. Okay. There is a slide which comes again, which will, um, which is a visual representation of stress. I'll come to that. Um, types of stresses. Um, at your age, um, the age you guys are at, most of the uh, stresses are exam stresses, relationships, friendships, crushes, infatuations, teachers scolding you, parents putting pressure on you for getting engineering or medicine or whatever. Those are the kind of st stresses at your age in life. But there are many kinds of stresses. The four classification, the four major kinds of stresses are these, okay? Catastrophes, major life events, daily hassles and ambient stresses. I'll tell you what they are. Catastrophes, now we are going through a COVID pandemic, aren't we? So pandemic, earthquake, wars, Ukraine, Russia, war, floods, earthquakes, those are catastrophes, okay? Major life events, going to university, marriage, death, birth, divorce, moving house, those kind of major life events. Daily hassles is traffic jams, schoolwork, coursework, meeting deadlines. Those are daily hassles or daily micro stresses. And ambient stresses are like pollution, global warming, noise. Those are ambient stresses. Now, if you look at this, this, if you look at my cursor moving, these are micro stresses like meeting deadlines at work, uh, school homework. Those are micro stresses. And you can call catastrophes these as macro, macro stresses, big stresses. Okay. So um, if you look at your lives, for you, the major kind of stresses, I'm assuming that the major kind of stresses will be whatever exams, homework, coursework, relationship issues, peer, peer relationship issues, friendships, um, um, pressure from parents to perform, whatever. Infatuations, crushes. That's a big one at your age. Yeah. So this is the stress bucket. If you look at the stress bucket, this is a very self-explanatory diagram. If you look at this uh, water coming into the bucket, if you look at the water coming into the bucket, that represents the stresses from outside. And the tap at the bottom, the tap here, if you look at my cursor moving, the tap at the bottom uh, represents your coping mechanisms. Yeah. The way you um, overcome the stresses or surmount the stresses or tackle the stresses. That is the tap. If the tap wasn't there, the water would have overflown. So what we need to look at is if the water keeps coming from outside, how can you increase the flow of the tap? Yeah, that is what we are going to look at in our session, how to cope with all the stresses because water will keep coming. That we can't stop. The demands and pressures of life will be there because life is such that it will place a lot of demands on us. It's not going to be cushy or hunky-dory or rosy all your life. So this is a very visual representation of how we deal with stresses. And when I work with children, when I use this diagram, they understand it, they get it. So that's what uh, we call, we use this diagram for the stress bucket diagram. So now the second poll is, can stress cause physical symptoms? Put it in the chat box and Satish will let me know. If there's anybody who says no, I would like to know. Why? Can I overwhelm me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody who thinks that stress does not cause physical symptoms? So far, no answers. No, no. Okay. All yeses. All yeses. So, so you, all of you are correct, okay? Each one of you, 100%. All of you are correct. Stress does cause physical symptoms and stress causes any kind of symptoms. You name it and it causes... Even if you look at um, um, illnesses, big illnesses like cancer and um, ulcers and diabetes and hypertension and blood pressure, 
stress contributes. I'm not saying stress causes it, but stress contributes in increasing it or exacerbating it or maintaining it. Okay, so stress, what I'm trying to say is mind and body are connected. So stress in the mind can give body symptoms, symptoms in the body. So mind and body are very much connected. They are not separate. There's no duality. It's not mind-body duality. They, they, they are interconnected, mind and body. So stress in the, in the mind can cause bodily symptoms, headaches and high blood pressure and all sorts. So name it and you can have all kinds of symptoms with stress. Now, the third question is this. Is there something called good stress? Uh, Satish will let me know the answers. Is there good stress? Yes, I put this no. Up. Yes, no, no. Yes. So, so here some of no, the no. So mix it. Yeah, fifty percent no. Yeah, 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 yeah. More no's. More no's. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, well. Um, the answer is yes. Okay. The answer. It sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds paradoxical. It sounds ironic. But there is something called good stress. I'll come to that. And I keep putting these cartoons so that you don't go to sleep. It's only to waken you up and liven up the presentation. That's the reason why. Um, distress is bad stress and you stress is good stress. Yeah. And I will tell you what it is. You stress and good stress. Um, you don't have to remember this fancy name, the yerkes dodson law, but you just look at the x-axis and the y-axis. If you look at the x-axis and y-axis, and if you look at stress at the bottom, and performance on this side on one axis, if the stress is very, very low, the performance is also very low because you're complacent. You're very complacent about it. You can't be bothered to put in the work. If the stress is very, 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 very high, you can't work because your mind is clouded. You can't concentrate. You can't put in the effort. You're actually paralyzed by anxiety. It's too much. But the right amount of stress, when there's a deadline, all your focus is, is on, on the work. I work very well to deadlines. If I've got a deadline tomorrow, I can do the work in two hours. But if the deadline is next week, the work spreads, you know, over the time. It fills up the time that I have. So the right amount of stress is the optimum amount of stress. This is the optimum amount of stress, which gives optimum performance. See, this is the, the best performance when the stress is medium. When the stress is too high, you're too stressed. It's too much. You can't. Nothing is going into your head. You're you're, you can't concentrate. You're panicking, basically. And if the stress is too low, you'll keep procrastinating and avoiding thinking, oh, I'll do it later. You become too complacent. So there's a right amount of stress which is needed to fuel you or propel you or push you to do the work. So there is this good stress and bad, bad stress. Okay. Does this make sense at all? that sometimes stress energizes you, it, it, it pushes you. There are some people who thrive, you know, when they have, they have some degree of challenges, they thrive in challenge, they don't see a challenge as a threat. So, so there is, a, has this made sense? Shall I move on? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, this is the concept of neuroplasticity. So, so the reason I put these kind of um, little concepts into this uh, presentation of mine is to seed ideas into, into your brains. Neuroplasticity simply means, that's a fancy term, neuroplasticity. It simply means that brain can learn new things and change. Brain can learn from birth till death, brain can learn. Brain is forming new connections, new synapses, new neuronal connections, new wiring and network is being formed. So you can keep changing the network in the brain, you know, it's not fixed. The networking, the wiring, wiring can be changed. So what I'm trying to tell is you guys are at an impressionable age from the age of whatever. I think you are 12 to 17, the age group today. So 12 to 17 is a very, very prime age, you know, when hormones are changing, brain is changing, body is changing. So many changes are happening in your life. It's a good time. There are two times which are very good. One is birth till five years, from birth to five years. And the second good time is your age, adolescence. It's a very good age. That doesn't mean I can't learn new things at my age. I, I'm past my prime. Um, so it, it is possible till, till your death, you can learn. But there are two times which are critical periods. We call them critical periods. So you're at a critical period. So you are very, very you're at a very good place in your life to learn new things. 
So your brain is very neuroplastic. Your brain is very receptive. It's a good time. So that's why I've put this slide saying strike while the iron is hot. The iron is hot. This is an impressionable age. You're growing. Your brain is growing. Your body is changing. It's a good time to make new connections in your brain, learn new things, make some rewiring if you need to do some rewiring in your brain. Now, the wall analogy. Now, what this means is it's a story. I'm going to tell you a story. OK. What this means is, um, you know, when I work with children, my, my age group, my children's age group is zero to 18. I work with children up to the age of 18. I have worked with adults in the past. I've worked with um, in adult psychiatry in the past. But right now I'm a child psychiatrist, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So I work with children up to the age of 18. So when children come, I sometimes tell the story if, if, the, um, if it's needed. And the story is such, yeah? You take a rock in your hand and with the rock, you throw at a glass window. And I ask them what happens. And when I ask them what happens, the answer they give is the glass breaks, obviously. And then I ask them, why does the glass break? And they give the answer, because you've thrown the rock, yeah? So then I ask them the question, if I take the same rock, the same rock, and with the same force, I throw it on the wall, what happens? And, and then they immediately get, get it, you know, they get what I'm trying to tell them. It's not to do with the rock. It's not to do with the force. It is to do with the inherent qualities of the glass and the wall. The glass is brittle, hence it broke. And the wall is robust and strong, hence it did not break. Or So what this uh, introduces, the story introduces is the concept of resilience, that the same stresses, people can react differently. If, if one person fails in an exam, that person will say, oh, I've got to study hard next time. And another pe person fails in an exam and they drink a bottle of bleach and try to kill themselves. You know, the stress is the same, failing in the exam, but one person says, I, I have, I've, I've got to work harder next time. I'm going to show everybody. I'll, I'll get good grades next time. I will prove people wrong. I will put in double effort and I'll pass. And the other person thinks, oh my goodness, I have let my family down. I've let myself down. I'm good for nothing. I'm a big failure and tries to commit suicide. So the stress is the same, but both of them have acted differently or behaved differently. So this wall analogy, what uh, in this story, what I'm trying to say is the rock and the force is the same, but the glass broke and the wall survived. So even, what I'm trying to say is resilience is not set in stone. Just now I talked about neuroplasticity, the brain can change. So if you think, oh, that person has got good willpower, that person is a strong person, I'm a weak person, it is not that way. You can improve. You can always, always keep improving yourself. Okay, and build your resilience. So this is what I put in order to show what a resilience is, like uh, how the same thing can be uh, perceived differently or by, by, by two different people. Um, just a minute, Satish. Uh, uh, there is a bar here which is coming in the way of, yeah, I have moved it. Yeah. <clears throat> So um, this quote, if we cannot direct the winds, we can adjust our sails. Does that make sense to you? The winds are beyond your control. Can you change the winds? No, that is nature, no. isn't it? Yeah, but you can adjust. If you're the captain of the little boat or the ship or you're manning the ship or the boat, you can adjust the sails. So there are things which are beyond your control, which you can't change. But there are things within your control which you can change. So you should be focusing on what you can change, what is within your control. And this person, if you can see my cursor, Viktor Frankl, he's my personal hero. Okay, He is an Austrian Jewish neurologist who was a holo Holocaust survivor. You know what a Holocaust is, isn't it? So he was in the concentration. Uh, I don't know what is Holocaust. <laughs> who, who can explain? Who knows Holocaust? Who can explain? You, you know, have you heard of Hitler? Hitler. Yeah, I yeah. have heard about that. I have heard that name. Yeah, Hitler was a German dictator who killed six million Jews, Jewish yeah. people. Yeah. So that yes. was Holocaust. Yeah. So during Holocaust, what he did was he sent, sent many Jews to concentration camps. And there they were gassed to death. It was very, very inhuman. It's black history. It's the worst period of history, I would say, where mercilessly 
Jewish people were killed just for being Jewish, not for any other reason, just for being Jewish. So Viktor Frankl was a Jewish doctor, a neurologist who spent four years in a concentration camp. He lost his mother, he lost his father, he lost his brother and he lost his wife. And after four years of inhuman dehumanizing experience, he came out and wrote a very, very beautiful book called Man's Search for Meaning. And I love that book. And he talked about how in any given circumstances, even in the worst of circumstances, you always have the freedom to choose. You always have the freedom to choose. That freedom nobody can take away from you. So he is, um, uh, the reason I put that, that there is because there's always a choice as to how to think about the situation. And um, now the connection between thoughts and feelings. Um, um, now, thoughts and feelings are connected. Um, how should I put it across? Uh, give me a name there. Let me find a name. Um, um, uh, give me one or two names, uh, Satish, in the audience. Hina Mehta. Hina. Okay, Hina. Okay, Hina um, is um, uh, walking on the street and Satish sir is walking on the other side. And suppose uh, Satish sir doesn't say hello to Hina. And Hina feels very bad. She feels Satish sir is ignoring me. Satish sir doesn't like me. Satish sir has got some other favorite students. Um, he, he doesn't think highly of me and she's feeling upset about that. Okay. So that is because she's thinking Satish sir doesn't like me. Satish sir is ignoring me. Satish sir uh, is uh, liking other students. He's got some favorite students and everything. So now Hina is walking on the road and Satish sir passes and does not say hello. That is the same thing, same event, same behavior. But she thinks Satish sir is too busy. She, he's got to arrange a grained lecture. He's so busy. He's arranging, he's chasing up that Dr. Sina from England to arrange a lecture. He's got so many things on his plate. He's a busy man. He did not notice me. He's preoccupied. Maybe he did not see me. So just thinking like that has changed the feeling. She's not feeling upset. Hina is not feeling upset. So what I'm trying to say through this example is thoughts and feelings are connected. It's not the behavior which makes you feel bad. It is the thinking which goes into your head with the behavior. Satish sir passing and not saying hello is the behavior. But if you think, oh, he's so preoccupied, he's a busy man, he's doing grained, he's doing nirachartha, he's a social entrepreneur, he's got many things on his plate, he, he did not notice me. The, the feeling is different because you're thinking different. But if you think, oh, he doesn't like me, he's ignoring me deliberately, he's got other favorite students, you're feeling sad. So the behavior is the same. The change in the thinking has changed the feeling. So this, I have put this slide, the carry home message in the slide is thoughts and feelings are connected. Good thoughts, good feelings, bad thoughts, bad feelings, as simple as that, as simple as that, okay. Now, um, this, um, if you look at this uh, slide, are you okay? Always the same question, I'm fine, always the same lie. So if you're not feeling fine, do tell I'm not feeling fine. Don't lie saying I'm fine because don't wo create walls around you, yeah? Don't wall yourself in, reach out. A, it sounds cliched, but a sorrow shared is a sorrow halved. Reach out. There are people out there who care about you and who want to help you. So if you're stressed, talk about it. A sorrow shared is a sorrow halved. And people may uh, have ideas which you can use. If you wall yourself in and close yourself in, you're struggling with it on your own and it grows more and more powerful. The sorrow inside becomes more difficult and you can't hold it in. It is best, best to share. And if you say, I'm fine, um, when you're not feeling fine, your body language gives it away, you know. Um, I'll talk about bo body language in a bit. Your body language says you've lost interest. I'll, that was just a, um, a sly, uh, cartoon to talk about. Now, analogic versus digital. It sounds a bit complicated, analogic versus digital. It's a, it's a term which comes from photography. If there are any photographers in the audience, you'll know what analogic and digital mean. In simple terms, analogic means non-verbal, means body language, and digital means verbal, what you talk, yeah? So if you're saying, I'm fine, thank you, but if you're, I, I'm not a very good actress, so I can't act properly, but if you say something like, I'm fine, thank you, but if your face is not fine, you'll come to know, you know, body can't lie, your body language can't lie, it's congruent, it's congruent to how you're feeling, but your words can lie. 
you can say i'm fine thank you even when you're not feeling fine thank you but your body will be slumped your shoulders will be hunched your face will be sad your eyes will be sad so what i'm trying to say is try to pick up cues if you have friends who you think are sad or miserable or depressed or something you the body language does not lie it, your words can lie yeah so analogic versus digital communication so in communication you should more focus on the body language confidence is seen in people it is visible you know it's palpable and um, so uh, in this slide what the carry home message is analogic versus digital that is analogic is body language and digital is verbal communication and analogic is non verbal communication not words so in that you focus more on the body language of the person if you are trying to find out what the real message is and um, in communication in any communication only 20% is verbal only 20% of the communication 80% of the communication is body language uh, mannerisms voice confidence all those kind of things so, so more of the communication in any person is non non verbal it's 80% is non verbal only 20% is verbal now again we all know this don't we a stitch in time saves nine prevention is better than cure you heard that haven't you a stitch in time saves nine so prevention is better than cure and this slide weeble is a toy okay weeble is a egg shaped toy with the center of gravity such that each time it falls it stands back again it falls and it stands back again you push it you push it it goes down but it it, it pops back again so it used to be a toy which was sold here in the in the in, in the uk and the tagline the advertising tagline was weebles wobble but they don't fall down i think that's not exactly a correct tagline weebles wobble but they don't fall down they fall down but they stand up again they fall down and they stand up again so i want you to be like weebles you know because any time you have problems coming your way any time we all have problems we are all living through life we are human beings we are sentient human beings we are sensitive human beings so we will have problems in our life but each time we fall down we have to have the um, resilience or the courage or the strategies to stand back up again like a weeble okay and that is the same quote which i have put here a uh, nelson mandela quote do not judge me by my successes judge me by how many times i fell down and got back up back up again so this is like a weeble how many times fell down and got back up again so uh, and coping strategy um coping strategy is simply methods which you use to overcome a stress overcome a problem yeah that is what coping strategy is i Uh, so we'll come to that now adaptive simply means helpful and maladaptive means unhelpful you don't have to think of adaptive and maladaptive you only have to think of helpful and unhelpful and this is not rocket science it's very very simple stuff uh, helpful strategies will be reaching out to a friend talking to a friend talking to your parents or if you if you don't want to talk to your friends or parents you can take professional help and go to a counselor exercise music hobbies walking meditation sleep name it netflix amazon prime whatever you want to call it whatever uh, gardening for me uh, my uh, adaptive strategies or helpful strategies are my hobbies um gardening and stitching and knitting and all those kind of things Re reading and films and all those kind of things painting now maladaptive unhelpful um, coping strategies will be alcohol drugs when i talk of alcohol i'm not talking of social drinking i'm talking of alcohol addiction or drug addiction overeating um, smoking those are all unhelpful i'm not taking a sanctimonious position um, i'm not going to take a sanctimonious position and be judgmental but i'm saying those are unhelpful strategies i'm not using the word right and wrong i'm not saying right strategies and wrong strategies i'm using helpful and unhelpful because that is that is a better term it's not pejorative it's not um, like putting a person down um and unhelpful unhelpful strategy even avoidance if you have an exam coming and you're avoiding your studies and instead of studying you're doing other things you're avoiding your studies or procrastinating delaying and postponing even that's an unhelpful strategy postponing procrastination avoidance all those are unhelpful unhelpful strategies um the serenity prayer um if you read that 
grant me the serenity to accept the things which i cannot change the courage to change the things which i can and the wisdom to know the difference what is it saying accept the things i can't change courage to change the things which i can and the wisdom to know the difference what this is saying is you need to put your energy into areas where you can make a difference or you can change there are many things beyond your control there are many things beyond our control which we have no control over but things which we have control over that is the area where you need to put your energy in if you put your energy in things which you cannot ch change it's of no use it's like the earlier slide where i talked about if you if you can't direct the winds you change the direction of the sails if you can't change the wind you change the direction of the sails it's it's like that you put your energy into areas where you can change and you have to know the you have to have the wisdom to know the difference what i can change and what i cannot change um are, are all of you with me still or um, is there anything you want me to repeat or are, are you all with me still because i, I i'm talking to a computer monitor here if you are all with me still i'll carry on with the next few slides yes ma'am yes ma'am okay okay yes ma'am yeah okay so victim versus survivor analogy when i uh, work with my children i always call them my children i give them this analogy and they understand it you know it's again a swimming analogy a victim is a person who's drowning drowning in water survivor is a person who's just about floating a thriver is a person who's swimming ahead and a winner is a person who's reached the destination so we all go through these stages you know we all go through these stages some days we feel oh my goodness we are inundated inundated with work or stress and you feel like you're drowning you feel like you're floundering and some days you're just ba barely staying afloat and some days you're managing to do all the work which is needed all the tick boxes done and you at, at night when you go to sleep you think oh well it's a good day we've i've sorted everything i've not kept anything for the next day and some days you've reached your destination these are not set in stone and these are not like compartmentalized you can move from one one to the other some days you're a victim some days you're a survivor some days you're a thriver yeah it's not one single state all the time okay this the, the reason i've put this is i work with children if i was a surgeon if i was an operating surgeon i would have used scalpels and knives for operating but when i work with children i am using my own self you know it is myself which is the instrument of change i don't have scalpels or knives to operate i am the i am the instrument of change so if i don't look after myself how can i look after other people so it's very important for me to look after myself in order to look after other people the reason i'm saying this to you is you guys you children need to look after yourself well in order to perform your best in order to put in your best in your exams in your personal relationships in your life emotionally you need to be full how can you pour from an empty cup so it's very important to look after yourself if, if you've got to give you know if you've got to give other people this is just to say that you should not underestimate the importance of hobbies in your life or leisure time leisure is very important it sounds again cliched if i say all work and no play makes jack a dull boy you may have heard that all work and no play makes jack a dull boy so it's important to have time for unwinding for leisure for relaxing whatever it is whatever you you do for 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 relaxing people have different methods of doing it you need to find what works for you yeah and i i was talking about hobbies again i'm showing off earlier on i showed off my painting didn't i my self portrait now i'm showing off my embroidery that's an embroidery that i've done it took me 5 years it's completed now this is incomplete and it is 67 colors and 67000 stitches it was me time and i used to do i work full time i work monday to friday full time and in the evening i used to do one or two threads every day one or two threads every day and it took me 5 years last year the covid year i finished it 20, 2020 i started it in 2015 so what i'm trying to say is passion can turn something very ordinary into extraordinary in case you guys don't believe i put my photograph here with the with the embroidery now it's complete framed and on the wall just to show that i'm not bundle bundle marrowing here mm? and um, 
this slide is just to show that where there's a will, there are a few ways, a few ways in the sense one problem has got more than one solution. It's not just one problem, one solution. It's not where there's a will, there is one way. Where there's a will, there are a, there are a few ways. There are many ways of tackling a problem. And that is where this comes in. You don't have to remember this, this fancy term, concept of equifinality. You don't have to remember that. What I'm trying to say in this slide is, in common parlance, it simply means, in common language, it simply means there are many ways of skinning the cat. You can follow my cursor. My cursor is at S here. S means starting point, starting point. And here my cursor is at the D point. D means destination. So from the start to the destination, if, if Hina takes this uh, route and Tessie teacher takes this route and Sina takes this route and Satish takes a different route. So there are many routes to the same destination. There are many ways of skinning the cat. There are um, all roads lead to Rome or something like that. What it means is um, what, whatever. Um, Ankita's way of doing things can be different from Hina's way of doing things. And Fez, I, I saw one person called Fez. Fez's way of doing things will be different from Tessie teacher's way of doing things. So what I'm trying to say is there is no one single formula of how to manage stress or how to deal with stress. Whatever works for you and whatever helpful, not unhelpful strategies, whatever helpful strategies you use, do more of the same to, to help because life isn't easy. <laughs> now, this slide I have put just see, you can see the doctor is saying you need strong medicine to relieve your stress. I'm prescribing a puppy. The reason I say this, I work with children with autism and learning disability and dyslexia and depression, OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, all sorts of difficulties. It's a skewed population who come to me. It's the troubled ones who come to me and they do very well with pets, you know because dogs give unconditional love. You don't have to justify yourself to a dog. You don't have to explain yourself to a dog. And with a dog, they feel 100% loved. So it is therapeutic. Pets, I don't want all of you today, how many, 43 people in the audience, I don't want all of you to go home today and tell your parents to buy you a dog or a cat. Don't do that. Don't say Dr. Sina has said everybody should have a pet. It's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is pets are very therapeutic. They are they give you a lot of uh, love back. In fact, they give you more back than what you give them. Yeah. My, my, I have children who've got snakes as pet, lizards as pet, turtles and hamsters and guinea pigs and all sorts. Um, um, exercise is very, very good for you. Very good. Exercise pumps up all the good hormones in your body the endorphins, the adrenaline. So exercise, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of exercise. So do try to have a little bit set aside every day for going for a walk or going for a run or doing a bit of skipping or hula hoops or something. Um, even if it's in, in, in your room with a YouTube video on and a few minutes of uh, exercise is, is good. It, it is a good antidote for depression. Sorry, when I work with children with low mood or depressive symptoms, one of the social prescribing, we call it social prescribing, um, not pharmacological prescribing or medical prescribing or giving pills, social prescribing is exercise. Uh, food, the reason I put this is food is very important uh, because uh, healthy eating and uh, what to say balanced diet is very important um, because anemia uh, can cause sort of low concentration, uh, low mood, cognitive difficulties, fuzziness. Um, it can mimic sort of low grade depressive symptoms. Anemia can, vitamin D deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency. So a healthy balanced diet is very important. And then uh, more fruits, I don't have to tell you that, you all know it. Occasionally you can have junk meal or have KFC or McDonald's or whatever, but generally have a healthy balanced meal. Berries are very good. They are very high in antioxidants, very, very high in antioxidants uh, and good fats versus bad fats. If you go and check out on Google, you'll find out what are good fats and what are bad fats. Good fats, if you eat almonds or uh, walnuts or uh, cashews and those kind of things, they're they are good fats, but not too much. Too much of anything is bad. And don't eat to a full stomach. Always keep your stomach a little um, like 80 percent. Eat 80 percent, not up to here, not full tank. Um, this I have put just to show There's that we are all. 
Let's say question yeah, from Muhammad Asif. He's asking, ma'am, does depression affect your digestive system? It can, it can. It can cause somatic symptoms. Um, it can, if you're asking about, I didn't understand it properly, but if you're asking about somatization, depression can sometimes present with somatic symptoms. Soma somatic symptoms means bodily symptoms, physical symptoms like nausea, feeling sick, feeling like vomiting, headaches, tummy pains, like that. It can come sometimes if people are not good at verbalizing or vocalizing their symptoms, it comes sometimes comes as body symptoms. So the answer is it can, yeah. These are the babushka dolls, the Russian dolls. They are called the babushka dolls. The reason I put put it here is because we are all multi layered, aren't we? We have many, 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 many layers like onion peels. We are not just what we see on the outside. We are not just what we see on the surface. So we are multi layered, and that is a Socratic um, quote. Socrates was a Greek philosopher, um, and an unexamined life is not worth living. The reason I have put these slides is these are my. This is my philosophy of living. So that's why I speak with so much of conviction because I believe in what I'm saying. And this is my philosophy of life and it works for me. There may be other methods of doing it, but for me, it is very important for us to know ourselves well, to know what we are as a person. And the Johari window. Now, this may be a little bit complicated for you guys, but if you look at the four quadrants, four quadrant, it is very self-explanatory. If you look at this known to self, and known to others is the open self or the public self. The self which everybody knows about me and what I know about myself is open self, the public self. This is the secret. The hidden self is the secret self. It is known, known to you, known to Muhammad, but not known to others. So that is Muhammad's secret self, which is fine. It is okay for people to have secrets. This is the area where we need to work on, the blind self. If I know something about Muhammad, but Muhammad doesn't know about it, it's the blind spot. He's got a huge, big blind spot, which I need to tell him, see this, what you're doing, I don't approve of this, or you sometimes do such and such, but you don't realize it. So this is the blind spot or the, the blind self. That is the area where we need to work on and we need to shrink and shrink and shrink. We are all work in progress, you know. What our aim in life is to become a better and better person and to decrease our blind spots. And it happens in a very safe relationship with a good friend or a spouse or a partner or some or parents or something. And the unknown self is the subconscious self or the unconscious self, which we don't know. We don't know. The other people don't know. And even we don't know. Even Muhammad doesn't know. And even outsiders don't know. But this is the, this is the area where we need to work on the blind spot which other people know about you, but you don't know about yourself. Has this made sense? Or does anybody want the further explanation on this? No, ma'am. It's, it's very understandable, isn't it? So the area where we need to work on is this quadrant. We need to shrink this quadrant, become make it smaller and smaller, our blind spots. And all of us have it, you know. Nobody's perfect. Even God is not perfect. We are all flawed individuals. We all have inadequacies and limitations and we are working on it and making it better and better. <laughs> this ties in very well with the previous one. This is, I just now talked about how we are all flawed individuals. Flossum is a term which was coined by the supermodel Tyra Banks. Yeah, so flossum, we are all flawed individuals, but we are awesome nevertheless. What this means is, we shouldn't be complacent about our, our negatives or our limitations. We need to keep working on improving, but we don't have to beat ourselves about it. We need to accept it, embrace it, and think we are awesome nevertheless, despite our flaws and despite our limitations and despite our inadequacies, okay? It doesn't mean, oh, this is how I am. Take me or leave me. I'm not going to change. It's not that. I'm always trying to become better. I'm, I'm trying to change. I have got flaws. I'm not perfect. So this, I, I quite like that term because, and um, this is a painting by, it's called Persistence of Memory. It's a painting by Salvador Dali. If you look at what Dali has stated here, at the age of six, I wanted to be a cook. At seven, I wanted to be Napoleon. My ambition stopped when I became Dali. This is quite profound, you know. What it means is, Muhammad should try to become the best Muhammad he's capable of being. Hina should try to become the best Hina she's capable of being. 
and Satish sir should become the best Satish sir he's capable of being and Tessie teacher should become the best Tessie teacher she's capable of being. It simply means we need to bring out our best potential. We don't have to compare ourselves with others. I don't want to become Dali. I want to become the best Sina I'm capable of being. So that brings us very neatly into our next slide, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, you don't have to remember Maslow or anything. All that you need to remember is if you look at the pyramid here, if you look at the pyramid, the top pyramid is self-actualization and self-fulfillment. All the time you need to try to become better and better and better. You're, you are a work in progress. Each one of you are a work in progress and you should try to become better all your life throughout because we will never reach perfection and there is always room for improvement. The biggest room in this world is room for improvement. So there's always room for improvement. And these kind of needs, you all are from good families with parents who are loving and your these needs are met, you know, the bottom needs. There are some people where even these needs are not met. You can see my cursor, the food, water, roti, kapda or makan. Even that is not met. If you look at the Dharavi slums or people on the streets in Mumbai, even the basic needs are not met. If the basic needs are not met, how will they reach here? So we, we, are, we are all fortunate because we have got all this, things which we take for granted. We already have. We have a home. We have a good family. We have good friends. We have food on the table every day. We are not starving. So these needs are met. Then comes this intimacy and relationship and friendships and love and all those kind of things. And then prestige, job, accomplishment. But the most important thing is this. Uh, where's my cursor? Yeah, this self-actualization and self-transcendence, becoming better and better and create uh, and fulfilling one's biggest and fullest potential. So that should be your aim. Okay. This is not a morbid slide. Memento. Memento simply means remember. Memento in Latin means remember and mori means death. Okay. Mori. You can uh, see that mortuary or morgue, all those words come from mori. Um, so this is remember death. And I did not put this in a, in a morbid way. This is a painting in the Renaissance period in the past, many hundreds of years ago, many painters used to draw or paint a skull. They used to even have a skull on their desk, you know, on their bench at their study table. They used to have a skull just to remind themselves that life is finite. Life is very finite. We have maybe 60, 70 years of life, maybe 80 years. It's very finite. And they usually have a, a, a hourglass, an hourglass just to show that the time is slipping away. Yeah. So these kind of paintings, the Memento Mori kind of paintings used to be um, symbolic to show that life is finite and death is a universal leveler. If you look at two levelers in life, there are two levelers, time and death. Even uh, Elon Musk or whoever, Bill Gates will have only 24 hours in a day. Whoever they are, rich or poor, they will have only 24 hours in a day. So time is a big leveler and death is a big leveler. Death is a universal leveler. Everybody dies. It's inevitable. So what this is trying to show is in our finite life of 60 years or 70 years, whatever our lifespan is, how are we going to fill it with? What are we going to do in our life, in the life that we have been gifted? It's a gift. In this life which we have been gifted, how are we going to fill our life? Um, and live life forward, but work your life backwards. It simply means, um, how do I give an example? For example, a small example I can give is if, you, if you're saying that in, in 10 years time, I want to be working in a Berkshire Hathaway um, organization. And in order to work there, I need to do my engineering degree. In order to do my uh, engineering and IIM, I have to go into IIT and IIM, whatever. So you, you, you know where you want to be and then you work backwards as to what I should be doing now in order to get there, that kind of a thing. And essentially, if you look at it, I'm an existentialist, is essentially, if you look at it, life is meaningless. Essentially, we all try to find our own meaning for our existence. We all try to find our own meaning for our existence. So it is very important to make the most of every day, to have a personal commitment towards every day, to make each day purposeful and each day meaningful. So um, now comes, have you, in, any of you watched the film Forrest Gump? That is Little Gump, the young Gump. Uh, Forrest Gump is a 1994 Oscar winning movie. 
in which um, he has got learning disability and uh, uh, I think he's on the autistic spectrum. Um, so this is the young Gump, Forrest Gump. He is, um, his first name is Forrest. So he, the young Forrest is asking his mom, what's my destiny, mama? And Mrs. Gump says, you're going to have to figure it out yourself. What I'm trying to say with this slide is each one of you have to figure out what your destiny or what your purpose is. You need to figure it out. You're in the uh, driver's seat. You're not in the passenger seat of the car. You're in the driver's seat. You're driving your own, own life forward. And take control of your life. Almost every problem has at least one solution, if not more. Feeling a loss of control is one of the main causes of stress. And when you are in control of your life, you feel empowered. And uh, yeah, take accurate. The, I have put accurate in inverted commas simply because accurate responsibility simply means if you take too much responsibility where you're not uh, supposed to, you blame yourself. You're beating yourself up. And if you take too less responsibility, you think it's somebody else's problem. So that's why I put, put accurate in inverted, co in inverted commas. And um, own your journey because you're the script writers of your life. You're the authors. You're the script writer of your life. Your life is not being directed by somebody else. You're, you're, the, you're the writer. You're the author. And when you have the courage to walk into your own story, you own it and you get to write the ending. Okay. And hope is something you always, you must have seen this film, Shawshank Redemption. It's a film of hope. And that's Andy Dufresne, this one. And that's Morgan Freeman as Red. And it's a film about hope. Why I put this slide is hope should always be there, that things will get better. If you're going through a very tough patch in your life or a very stressful life in your, uh, a, a very stressful patch in your life, you ought to remember that it will get better. This time will pass. It's not going to be there forever. Because if I were not hopeful of things changing, I wouldn't even be doing my job because most of the young people who come to me, they have such disadvantaged lives, you know, they have such, there's nothing going for them. And yet I have to keep, keep hold of hope and instill hope in them. That is the most important. If a child comes to my room, in, into my therapeutic room, in my therapy room and goes out of the room feeling hopeful, I've done my job. That's half the battle won. Um, so some carry home points. Um, we talked about nobody's exempt from stress. Nobody's exempt. Everybody. It's only the dead person who does not have stress. Everybody feels stressed sometime or the other in their lifetime. Um, it, determined by personal characteristics in the sense we talked about resilience, isn't it? Some people cope with it better and some people cope with it in, in different ways. So it is determined by the person that you are. And mind and body are connected. Um, there is something called good stress. We talked about resilience and um, we talked about adaptive and maladaptive means helpful and not helpful coping mechanisms. We talked about customized strategies like uh, Faiz's way of uh, dealing with stress will be different from Hina's way of dealing with stress or Mohammed's way of dealing with stress. We talked of the serenity prayer in the sense we should be putting our energy into what we can change and not wasting our energy on something which can't be changed and something beyond our control. And we talked of self-actualization. What's the most important thing is to become better and better and better, becoming the better best person you're capable of being. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Wonderful session. Thank you, Mohammed. Pin drop silence. Please do ask. I told you at the beginning that if you ask me a question I don't know the answer for, it will be a very successful session. Ma'am, I have a doubt which, like, I didn't understand, like, when, we, when we're telling to we living a life forward, but we had to also go behind ourselves. I no, what I meant, what I meant was, suppose you have a goal, something simple. Uh, you tell me a goal which you have. Uh, um, earn full marks next time. Getting full marks next time. Full marks in exam. Yes, okay, so uh, so if if that is what you want to get, full marks in exam, and your exam now it is uh, March fourth, isn't it? And your exam is in April. Yeah. So April, whatever, fifth is your exam and you have one month. So you decide in one month, I've got four subjects to study. In four subjects, 
I've got to give one week to each subject. And in that one week, I've got um, in one subject, I've got eight chapters. So, so many, so many time for eight chapters. What I'm trying to say is you make a goal and then you work backwards as to how I should be reaching that goal. Did you get me? Okay. Did you get me? And taking less steps the simplest, to the reaching the goal. That's the simplest example I can give. Suppose you have made a goal and that's somewhere three months down the line. Then you work backwards and then think how to go from now to that three month goal. How will I reach there? I've got, if you're talking of exams, the only thing I can think of is I've got so many chapters to finish. I've got so many hours. I've got to do two chapters every day. I've got to do English in one week. I've got to do maths in two weeks because maths is more hard. So English one week, maths two weeks. So that, that kind of thing. It's not for me to decide or prescribe to you what to do, but that kind of thing. Um, so you mean taking the steps to reaching the goal? You have to plan at yeah. Yeah. How to be yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you said uh, about good stress and bad stress. Uh, do you mean to say that uh, it is uh, me, for example, I have to decide what is good, what is bad stress for me? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. It won't affect the everybody the same way. Now, birth of a child is considered very positive, isn't it? But even that can be stressful. Stress is something which outstrips your resources. If the demands outstrip your resources, it is stressful. Whatever it is, even if it's something small, if it tips the balance, like the last straw which broke the camel's back. Yeah, you're right about it, Ganga. It is, it is for you to decide because for somebody else, it may be very, very challenging and they will be thriving on that. And for you, it will be very stressful. It is not the same for everybody. It depends on your perceptions, your values, your resources, your coping, everything, your social support, everything. So many factors determine. Um, so uh, even a positive life event can be stressful. Now, having moving to a new house, a big house is a positive event, but it can be stressful because there's so much to do in the move. So it can be stressful, even if it's a positive event. It doesn't always have to be a bad, bad event. Has it made sense? Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and some, sometimes um, some degree of stress for me, deadlines are helpful, I can tell you. Now, Satish asked me to do this today and I was sitting and making my PowerPoint this morning. So properly, it, before one o'clock, it's my time one o'clock. I'm five and a half hours behind because I'm in UK. But my time one o'clock, it finished. But if if it was in the evening at seven o'clock, it would have finished at seven, seven o'clock. So for me, deadlines help. That correct amount of uh, pressure to finish it off. So... Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. It was a great session with all the personal examples and stories. Thank you, Ganga. There is I a second one. part. There's a second part next week, and I'm going to talk of study skills. But today's session was very broad. It's just broad. It's about life, how to deal with life so that we don't stress ourselves out too much. It was a Dr. very Sina generic one. session. Dr. Sina, one one question. Okay, test students. Uh, students nowadays, uh, many students they told when they have a lot of stress, they start playing PUBG. What is that? It's a computer PUBG, game. PUBG. Uh -huh, game. It's, uh, a it, game. it's a game. It's uh -huh. an avoidance, isn't it? It's an avoidance. They don't want to face the stress. Yes. It does not help. It is like putting uh, the ostrich putting its head in the sand and saying the world does not exist. When it puts its he head up, the world is still there. It's not gone away. So it is an avoidance and avoidance does not help. It does not help. You have to face it. It is not going to go away. So studies is not going to go away if you're sitting and playing. Uh, it's only going to make the stress more because it will pile up and pile up and pile up the uh, studies. So it is no point if you if you children are playing whatever that PUBG game. I don't know it. I'm too old for you guys. So it's of no use. It is procrastination, it's avoidance. Just face it. The only way to face a problem is face it in whatever way. Tackle it. Yes. It's not going to go away with avoidance. Yes.
your your the stress will increase because when it comes to exam time you'll have so much of studies to do then panic mode then it is panic then the studies nothing is going into your head you're bringing the roof down and getting angry with your mom and dad and displacing your anger somewhere else and it yeah so don't avoid avoidance is an unhelpful um, strategy it's it is a coping strategy but it's an unhelpful coping strategy so any game not just pubg any game going into gaming is a way of avoiding reality avoiding facing the problem face the problem that's the only way what about having social anxiety and can't ask anyone for help you've come you you've given me a very good question what's your name um, redmi is it Re redmi uh, it, it says redmi what's your real name i think you're muted anyway you asked about social anxiety um i can understand that i can understand it's very hard for you with social anxiety to ask but there is only one way to do it practice 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 because i'm not the person now that i used to be 30 years ago i was a very shy person i couldn't talk in front of people so the, these are not something you're born with it is not genetics it is practice it is habit so you learn you learn initially it may be very hard for you the anxiety if you look at the anxiety curve there is something called habituation i don't have a paper and pencil here um I, will you be in next week um um will you be in next week the girl who, the person who asked me the i will explain to you there is something called uh, anxiety curve yeah so if that is the anxiety curve each time you do it it will go down the anxiety will go down and then down and then down so it's called habituation initially it's a lot of anxiety then it will go down then it will go down so what i'm trying to say is with practice the anxiety goes down it's not going to go through the roof it's not going to just go up and up and up and up and up it doesn't there is a is a peak level you will feel anxious i can understand that in social anxiety but practice anything comes with practice isn't it when i first started learning driving i was petrified i had to think of whatever the mirrors and the pedestrians and the road signs and the clutch and the brake and the steering my goodness it was uh, so many things you need to think of and after sometimes it becomes automatic you can talk to the passenger in the car and drive it becomes so internalized so initially there's so many things to think of you think am i ever going to learn will i ever learn driving it's so hard so what i'm saying is even social anxiety can be overcome with practice it's not like a switch on switch off you can't just switch off social anxiety but keep surmounting your anxiety and even if you're feeling scared inside just ask the question nobody is going to bite you nobody is going to insult you nobody is going to put you down yeah there are people out there to help you so it, you may have all negative thoughts in your head what if what if people laugh at me or what if the teacher insults me or those kind of questions that may be stopping you from asking i i didn't get the question you you put something in the chat box can, can you uh, please shine some light on peer pressure what sort of peer pressure are you talking of mohammed what sort of friends yeah so what sort of pressure is it pressure to conform is it pressure to take drugs is it pressure to smoke or to be all macho or a pressure to uh, go for um, whatever some games or something when you want to study you need to be assertive if that's the case mohammed you need to be assertive and if friends drop you because you've been assertive then they are not good friends anyway you need to be assertive assertive simply means no sorry i can't come now let me finish this off and i'll catch up with you later to do bad <laughs> to do bad things the answer is no tell them i'm not going to do it they will come round you stick to the principle that you have and they'll respect you for it they will come round if they are directing you to bad things just say i'm not interested sorry you have to be assertive and and you have to be the person that you are people will respect you for what you are you hold your ground you be sure of yourself and they will come round 
And who knows, you might get them to do what you're doing instead of you doing what they are doing. They might be inspired by you and follow you. You will become the role model, the benchmark, the gold standard. So you said the, you said the example. You don't have to join the crowd just to be a part of the crowd. You hold your identity, they'll come around, okay? If you guys are going to be next week, next week I'll be talking about study methods simply because most of your pressures or stresses are because of studies and exams. Today I was giving a general principle about stress and life. So next week it will be mainly targeted on exams and study methods.